It's great to see some familiar faces, and uh, I thought I'd take just a minute or two to um, introduce myself a little bit more. I started uh, teaching at Evergreen in the Masters of Environmental Studies program uh, in the fall of 2016. Uh, so just out of curiosity, how many Greener grads in the audience? Good. <laughs> Um, emer and emeriti faculty, excellent. Um, and I know there's some current students and faculty. Uh, it's been great for me. Uh, I was raised in Seattle. My mom's family is from Tacoma, so I consider myself a Northwesterner. And um, I guess just in terms of how I got interested in trying to answer this kind of question, um, I, like a lot of people my age, in the early 90s, I got my first job out of college uh, hooting for spotted owls uh, for the Oregon BLM, so right in the middle of the Timber Wars controversy. Um, and I hadn't been really a birder. I was interested in field biology, but um, I was out in the woods, and we were doing marbled murelet surveys in the morning sometimes, too. Um, so learning from some of my peers um, kind of got me into the f study of birds in the field. Um, and that's been most of my career. I've done uh, surveys, I've done mist netting, banding birds, I've done uh, nest searching and monitoring, I've done radio telemetry studies. Um, so lots of field-based research, and uh, that's still kind of my main interest, but I haven't been as involved with field research uh, recently. But I have been, or I, I feel very fortunate to have studied um, Michelle, I'm going to keep talking, but maybe we can have some help. I'm not sure what happened, because it's, it's not muted. Um, so, yeah, I've been lucky to, to be able to watch and study birds in Oregon, California, uh, Florida, New Mexico, and then Birders Paradise, Panama, um, where I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the 90s and then was able to go back about 10 years ago to do research. Um, and I'm mentioning some of this experience just to say that um, over the last, I guess since 2010, I've done more of these really large scale, you know, regional to continental wide analyses and using really big data sets from eBird, which are great resources. But I think it's really important for those of us doing this kind of work to kind of remember the on the ground. We, you know, one, we need the on the ground observations um, and that it's really important to not get lost in the computer programming and uh, data processing and, and remember the, the birds are, and other critters and plants are out there to, to go see. So, um, this is the three parts of my talk. Um, to get into this uh, second question, which is sort of the focus of the title of the talk, I'm first going to talk about phenology a little bit more generally. Um, and then trying to answer this question, <laughs> to what extent are migratory birds tracking earlier springs in places where it is getting warmer earlier? Um, and then talk a little bit about ongoing research. We don't have any papers out on it yet, but a, a um, newly funded research collaboration that I'm involved with. And I will, I'm, I apologize for my voice, I'm getting over uh, whatever virus has been going around. I feel better than I sound, um, hopefully. Oh, and, and I will say, um, I wouldn't be a good Evergreen faculty member if I didn't say, please wave your hand. Um, if you have a question along the way, I'll, I'll try to stop and, and uh, ask for questions at certain times. Um, but if you want me to slow down or explain something, um, I'm not planning on talking at you for 90 minutes, um, but I'd love to answer questions along the way, and then, of course, at the end, any questions that I didn't get to. Oh, and I will say, maybe not for the, the whole um, 
question and answer period. But if you want to tell me any crow stories afterwards, informally, my PhD was uh, studying um, urban crows in Seattle. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the work of John Marsliff in his book. So um, I was one of those people wearing the Dick Cheney mask wandering around <laughs> <laughs> UW campus. Um, and I know lots of people have great crow stories, but I'm not talking about crows here. OK, so phonology. Um, I do like to look at definitions and etymologies. So the study of pheno showing um, is one way of thinking of it. So uh, certain things happen seasonally. Um, and in particular, thinking about the influence of climate on natural pho uh, phenomena. Um, so that's why some people call it the science of the seasons. Um, and it can be, of course, anything from uh, when do plants flower, um, when do lepidopterans emerge from their cocoons, um, when do bears emerge from hibernation, lots of different kinds of natural biological phenomena um, that tend to occur over certain cycles. And people study phenology um, in a few different ways. Of course, as I alluded to earlier with talking about bird field studies, uh, direct observations are really important. So um, there's lots of data going back to the same place and recording when buds uh, first appear, when flowers first appear, when fruits first appear over time. Um, and any specific event um, like that uh, is called a phenophase. So that's one bit of vocabulary um, to remember about phenology. Uh, so insect emergences. Um, uh, things like butterflies, obviously, which are more visible and attract more attention just because you can go get people to uh, record data on them. So there's a, a community science project that the National Park Service um, has uh, done up in the Cascades. Um, but uh, others that maybe aren't as um, charismatic, like cicadas, may also have seasonal emergences. Uh, Different kinds of animal migrations. Obviously, the focus of the research I'll talk about is on birds. Um, but any types of seasonal arrivals on breeding grounds um, and observing them. So for a species like the western tanager, um, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the, the dark blue is the wintering or, or non-breeding uh, grounds mostly in uh, Mexico and Central America. And then the orange is, is different uh, where it might show up during migration, and then the main breeding range in, is in red. And I think this will work. Um, a Cornell Lab that houses all of the eBird, the, the community science, citizen science data, um, has done these really cool visu visualizations. So th this is not my work, but um, See if we can get it going for the tanager. <clears throat> mm, that's the problem. I see it on my screen. Hang on. So before I start this, um, you might recognize what I just said about the um, non breeding ground. So the abundance is from a light yellow low abundance or none observed in the gray to a darker um, blue. And once I animate this, this will go through um, a given year. And, and so this is based on multiple years of data. It's essentially combining um, all of the eBird observations um, and the, the times and some data processing uh, to come up with a uh, annual average model of uh, movements of the western tanager. Um, so we're into March, April this time of year, and that's when there's this big flush. And then look how quickly they turn around. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're up here for the breeding season, but it really is interesting, especially from the North American perspective. Um, it'll just kind of keep cycling through that. Uh, 
you know, there's so many studies of the breeding season birds, but they're often, and obviously it's a very important part of the life cycle because they wouldn't be reproducing without breeding. Um, but when you think about risks and threats in the, during the migratory and non-breeding season, in some ways it's, it's really important um, to take account of that too. Okay, so not just to only talk about birds, but um, timing of uh, other uh, animal breeding seasons. So when frogs start to call, um, when nest building starts to occur, getting fledgling counts when you s actually see um, young birds either coming out of the nest or, or with their parents in the uh, case of precocial young. So all of these are examples of direct observations that people can and do make. Um, sometimes it's really focused in a particular study area. Um, data sets like eBird, it's, it's the community science, community science um, idea where lots and lots of different people um, contribute observations. And so it's more in the power of numbers than saying we know exactly what's happening everywhere. Um, but phenology can also be studied using remotely sensed data. Um, so there's very well established ways of um, uh, using the reflectance, um, basically the, the wavelengths that are reflected back to uh, satellites to estimate things like uh, green up, meaning uh, after uh, a winter season, it starts to get warmer, plants start to grow new green leaves, and that is a signal in terms of the reflectance that satellites, and with a lot of really smart people that <laughs> can figure out the data processing, um, can detect. Um, and so this, this is, image is, is from um, Southern California, but the and, and these aren't true colors, but the, the darker green shows up in the spring, and you can actually essentially decide on, and with a lot of these uh, remotely sensed products, there's a systematic way of saying, this is the date that we'll call the quote unquote onset of greenness, um, or what's called green up. And then likewise, in the fall, if uh, trees and plants are losing leaves, there's a equivalent brown down um, in the autumn. Um, historical data uh, going back decades, centuries, um, has also been uh, really useful in terms of uh, thinking about phenology. So when um, natural historians like Thoreau do daily observations over in the same place over many, many years. You have this historical record. Um, you have to sometimes have to figure out what uh, certain observers mean by the names they used back then if, if they're of birds. Um, and then herbaria collections um, have been really important because they are the species of the plant, they're the place, um, they're the date they were collected, and then either directly recorded or just from seeing, is this a plant that's in flower, is it in bud, um, has been really useful to, to um, reconstruct some of these older historical uh, timings of, of certain things. Any questions? Um, they're coming up here in the summer to breed. So, I mean, it's really the spring when they're coming up. So this time of year um, into May, June, July is when they're up here. That's when they're breeding. It's warm. Um, they're, they can find food. I mean, all, all of the timing of this is, is what I'll talk about in terms of the specific kinds of research and what might be happening with climate change. But um, they're spending time in this part of the world further north when it's warmer and then going back south when it's cold up here. Oh. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> 
Um, and of course, again, not to be North American centric, there are birds that go the other way. So they might overwinter in the tropics, but go south um, because there's not as much land south of the equator in South America or Africa. There's not as many of those species, but there are some. And then of course the real uh, um, migration um, champions are the ones that go pole to pole. Uh, chasing the sun. So some general um, potential changes uh, in climate that might then affect the uh, seasonality of these uh, events. Um, in a lot of places, and obviously this is very generalized, um, and one thing that I'll say from the outset is that climate is quite variable. Um, there, in certain places, there are, are often, and especially now, directional trends that we're seeing as an effect of uh, climate change. Um, but these are obviously very um, kind of idealized. But in a lot of places, um, so if temperature is over here, I'm not going to be able to do this. <clears throat> Uh, temperatures over here, and this is just the time of year. Um, if you think of the red as um, the more more recent years, what is happening happening with general warming? You have a warmer winter, um, and then an earlier spring, meaning that the temperatures um, get warmer, and you accumulate what uh, in the plant and agricultural world is called growing degree days. If people are gardeners, they're probably familiar with that that prompt, it's accumulation of warmth, you could think of it that way, um, day after day that ends up prompting the um, plants to start growing more. Um, so that warming happens earlier. You also have a longer period of, of summer. So not so much, it, it, it's true that in some places summer average temperatures have increased, increased but in general the, the winter averages are what increase the most, but rather than a bump, you get also this longer, more persistent summer. So earlier springs, potentially later falls, um, and warmer winters. Um, and so the, the earlier timing of spring events is typically correlated with uh, warmer temperatures. It's not just a shift, but shift to one side, but a shift up in that kind of plot. Um, I've mostly been talking about spring, and I just want to acknowledge that um, people have been pointing to, don't forget about the other <laughs> end of the cycle. Um, with that said, I'm going to continue talking about spring. <laughs> but I'm not ignoring it, it just hasn't been the focus of um, the work I've been doing. Um, and so what have people actually observed? Now I'm going to Again, talking more generally before I go into the specific research project, um, these authors went back um, to Concord where Thoreau had done observations and um, looked at his uh, recordings of mean first flowering date. Um, and then another uh, natural historian, so right at the turn of the 19th century, um, and then they did uh, pr tried to replicate those kinds of observations and found that the first flowering dates um, had gotten about a week earlier since the 1850s, which, you know, thinking that's over 150 years, a week, maybe not a huge magnitude, but it is this kind of systematic earlier uh, first flowering. Um, and that kind of directional movement, and you can find places where things are happening later. Um, it's not just that, you know, obviously there's variation here, but it's not just that things are bouncing around, but a directional shift, either earlier or later, is called a phenological shift. It's another bit of vocab. There's quite a few um, terms in phenology research. They're not always used the same way by the same people, but, or by different people but I'll try to be consistent. <laughs> so that kind of movement is known as a shift. Um, again, from a, a, a large um, 
In this case, uh, in the UK, a butterfly monitoring scheme. Um, they have data on 44 butterfly species in the UK. Um, and so they're looking at um, uh, the, the date of first appearance and if in a given species that has changed. Um, and so 32 out of these 44, so this is not dates, this is just a frequency, the number of species that have changed um, by that number of days per decade. And I should say, again, just to um, be consistent, uh, imagine, um, if you're familiar with Julian dates, this will be um, easy to conceptualize, but imagine the first day of the year is one, and then you got all the, all the way to the last day of the year, is, which is 365. When you get earlier in the year, you're getting lower in number. So whatever the Julian date is, for April 5th, I could try to do it in my head real fast, but I won't. Um, if, there, if, if, if whatever that uh, number is, if you're a week earlier, you're seven below that number. So anytime there's a, a shift that's negative, that corresponds to an earlier date. So just keep that in mind. And then positive would be later. You're adding days if you're going later in the year. Um, <clears throat> So across the area that they were monitoring the butterflies, there was an increase of one and a half degrees Celsius in the average spring temperature, um, consistent with other places, a little bit smaller magnitude change in summer, but a sh uh, warming of one degree Celsius on average. Um, and you can see kind of the whole range. There's some that didn't really have any kind of significant shift, but some that shifted quite a bit earlier. And the, again, this is change per decade. So 10, 10 days earlier in a single 10-year period, now you're talking about a much larger magnitude than seven days over a 150-year period. Um, another example of, of a study, this is... Um, an, an earlier example of using herb, eBird data, um, and so it might be hard to see, but Alan Hur Hurlbert is the lead author, author, so remember his name, you'll see him later. Um, this was just in Eastern North America, um, but they found that 12 out of the 18 species that they felt had a good, um, fairly large, uh, uh, breeding distribution in terms of having lots of data and sightings um, uh, arrived earlier since 2001. So this was, I think, 10 years of data. Um, and that corresponded with, um, or, or sorry, if you corresponded the uh, amount of days that they were uh, arriving earlier for those that did, um, it was a little less than one day per degree of warming. So it's, it's really important, and um, this paper did it well in terms of not just saying, is there a shift, but is there a shift that might be a response to, to warming climate? Um, because of course, you can have variation um, in spring arrival dates and might not have anything to do with climate. Um, but another important point uh, just to show a few examples, again, these are all Eastern North America examples. Um, and so just because I know that's hard to see, the darker blue is a negative shift in spring arrival, so that's the earlier. And the redder, red is a positive shift, so that would be later. And you can see for any of these individual species, there's quite a bit of variation depending on what part of the breeding range they are found in, whether they're arriving earlier or in some cases, like the great crested flycatcher, along this edge of the breeding range, they're arriving quite a bit earlier, but right in the middle, they're arriving later. Um, so it's one of those things when, when if you, in the, the paper I'll go into more detail, um, we have that data, but then we also looked at the effect over their entire range. So it's, it's useful to do both uh, because you can miss uh -oh. You can <laughs> miss some of that um, regional or you know, 
you know, local variation if you're just grouping across the entire breeding range. Um, and then this uh, review paper is a little bit dated now, but um, Camille Parmesan, of course, people may have heard of her in terms of a leading researcher on climate change effects over the years. Um, so this was compiling uh, examples, um, specific studies. So each little bar is a specific study from these different taxa, from amphibians to birds to butterflies to plants. Um, and bars that are going down represent uh, a negative shift, again, meaning arriving earlier or flowering earlier or starting to uh, call if you're a frog um, earlier or coming down to the breeding ponds if you're a salamander. Um, and in some ways, it's not surprising there are examples of shifts later in the year um, because species are different, the climate might be changing in a different way, um, but there's not that many in what what this review is, is saying is it do, does look like there's a general um, shift to earlier in the year for a lot, across a lot of the different taxes. So in back first, go ahead. No, I'm um, sorry. So each, each bar is an individual study or species. I mean, it could be a group. So sometimes these studies are groups. The length of the bar corresponds to the magnitude um, of the effect, meaning the change in the, the timing of the spring in days per decade. So the longer the bar, the, the greater the shift was that was detected. Yeah. Well, that's, um, yeah, so the question was what other, what other factors or drivers might account for why individuals migrate, essentially, or as a, as a group, um, they start migrating. Um, I'll talk about birds, because that's probably the one I know the best, but if you imagine, I mean, you saw the Western Tanager example. If you're in southern Mexico or Central America, you're certainly not detecting any changes, <laughs> you know, thousands of miles away. Um, so photo period, how much light they're getting is thought to be um, part of it. Um, there has been work to ask is, basically is, are there temperature changes happening at the same time that then prompts, you know, there, there's definitely a very consistent um, effect. You can have birds in captivity, um, and they sense somehow, now it's time to mig migrate. They get very restless. Um, so you can take them out of the environment, so it must be also something else besides that. So that's, that's you know, professors are good at talking a lot, but it's a long way of saying not a lot is known. And there, there may be other things I'm not aware of, but other questions? Okay, so now I'm going to focus in on um, some research that I was uh, involved with and asking the specific question that was the title of the talk, are migratory birds tracking or are they keeping up with earlier springs? Um, and this uh, is now out in a journal called Scientific Reports. This is um, Nature's kind of online arm, um, so it's a little bit easier to get published in. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's open access. I meant to check, um, but I think that's what that open says. So if you're really interested, um, you can look it up. And so what we did, or I guess, I guess to back up, kind of what we are interesting in, um, in trying to study is, uh, especially where there is evidence that. Um, spring is, it, in a given place, if it's getting warmer earlier and there is spring green up, meaning the vegetation is coming out earlier, um, then how, to what extent are birds responding? Again, not responding to the direct cues, but are they keeping up with that earlier spring? Um, and so first, 
This is just a map of the um, change in onset of greenness. So this is that remotely sensed vegetation layer. Um, you get a date, you can uh, ask from this just 11 year period, so keep that in mind. That's not a, a, a large um, uh, time, set of time to, to try to do this. Um, in, is it uh, getting earlier? And so this is a trend in days per year, not days per decade. So if you get as big of uh, an effect as one day per year, that would, on average, be uh, equivalent to 10 days earlier over this 10-year uh, time period. Um, so you see more consistently in eastern North America, um, you know, small to, to fairly large earlier springs. Um, in the west, especially the southwest, it was actually later over this time period, um, except for right in kind of California and Nevada. So more variable in the west, which can happen. The, these uh, squares that you see are 200 kilometer square kilometers. So of course, if you're spanning um, the Sierra Nevadas, or if you're spanning the Rockies, you have a lot of elevational change in that 200 square block. So a little bit trickier to do this over the Western North America. Um, but we, so we characterized whether spring was occurring earlier, and of course some, in some places it's not, some places it was, some places it was occurring later, and then asked, um, well I guess, I guess, sorry, Conceptually, um, we want to acknowledge that we don't, this onset of greenness, that's, that's a date, but it's not that we think, okay, every single migratory bird is quote unquote supposed to arrive right on that date. Um, and in fact, I don't know if it, this has occurred to anyone, but if we're talking about spring green up and birds, there's kind of a missing piece. Anyone know what I'm thinking? Yeah. <laughs> what are they eating? <laughs> the migratory birds are not eating leaves. Um, but, <laughs> so this is our conceptual diagram actually from a, a grant proposal, but um, think of each of these circles as kind of an annual life cycle. Um, and climate might be changing, so from one year to the next, the cycle might be advancing at a different rate. Um, so you've got uh, branches, buds, and leaves. You've got lepidopterans laying eggs and then emerging um, as larvae, caterpillars that are eating the leaves, and then birds that are laying eggs um, trying to feed their young. And that's kind of the key link in between birds and the onset of greenness. We're expecting the caterpillars to be eating the leaves. And for a lot of migratory songbirds, even if the adults um, aren't primarily insectivores, those larvae, <coughs> those caterpillars, are really good sources of food for their nestlings. Um, so I guess the, the larger scale concern is that if birds are mistiming their arrival, they might be missing the peak uh, insect abundance. Um, and so we're using this onset of greenness essentially as a proxy for this is kind of the start of the cycle. We know caterpillars are coming in at some later stage. Um, for this study, we're not trying to measure anything about the insects, but we are measuring the onset of greenness and then in spring arrival. And so if there is in places where there has been some um, Right, this, this is before the change. So we kind of expect um, birds to arrive at some distance away from the onset of greenness. It might be different for different species. In fact, it is. Um, and so this difference is called phenological asynchrony, which is just mean things occur at different times. Asynchrony doesn't, doesn't mean that there's a negative consequence that. It might be you know, in some kind of idealized um, uh, natural world, <laughs> uh, birds might be able to time their spring arrival that's 
offset is asynchronous with the onset of greenness, but is ideal for getting that peak of caterpillars. Um, so then the question is, if there is a shift in green up, so in the cases where green up is occurring earlier, you might expect that birds would be better served if they shift their arrival. Um, so we have the remotely sensed layer of uh, the sh any shift in vegetation green up in the onset of greenness. For um, birds, what we have are eBIR data. Um, so you might have noticed I've been using the term community science, so we're getting away from, uh, this is what has been traditionally known as citizen science, but just in today's political climate, it's not as inclusive a term as community science. Um, so I'm trying to train myself to use the term community science, but that's what I mean by it. <laughs> um, so again, lots and lots of people going out uh, recording, um, checklists, they submit this, there's some data quality checking that Cornell does. Um, and what you end up with is, so imagine, uh, this is for one of these large um, 200 kilometer squ square cells. We accumulate all of the observations, um, in this case of house runs, and this shows the proportion of observations that are presences, meaning you have someone going out, are they recording house runs? Um, through the first three months, so that, here's where that Julian day shows up. So 90 days into the year is the end of March, roughly. Um, you see, for, uh, for one of these cells, uh, house runs aren't showing up until you get to about 105, 108 um, of the Julian date on the calendar. Um, and then there's a certain proportion of checklists that they start showing up. And obviously, if you can see those dots, there's a lot of variation. Um, and it's not that we expect everyone that goes out at a certain time of year to always see a house run. But um, it does kind of come up and then plateau, and what... Uh, fitting a, a logistic um, line, essentially, it gives you an equation that you can systematically get an estimate of when they're arriving. It doesn't mean it's the first arrival that would be there or the peak of arrival, but somewhere in there we're using as an estimate of spring arrival. And it's a, again, it's a systematic way of doing this for a given species in a given part of the country. And so we're going to use those dates. So again, we have dates of onset of greenness, and is there a shift over this 10-year, 11-year period? Um, and then for the birds, is there a, a shift, is there a trend over the 11 years in a species mean arrival? And it could be earlier, it could be no trend, or it could be later. Um, and then the trend in asynchrony is whether there's a change in mean arrival compared to the change in spring green up. <laughs> so what this looks like, um, here each of these pairs of dots with um, standard error around them are the estimates for a given species. So I don't have the species names down here because it gets too busy. Um, but each of these are a given species and you see uh, the arrival trend, so the blue is is there a difference over this 11-year period in when birds are arriving? Um, and so, just as a check if you're paying attention, why is it significant that these dots are below the zero line? <laughs> Earlier. <laughs> um, and then the green dots are the green up trend for that location, so this is the blue dots are for, for different species. No, sorry, not. This is over the species' entire range. So, this is where we are actually grouping all of that. Um, and so, where there's a difference between the blue dot and the green dot, that's where we're measuring asynchrony. asynchrony. So, where they're either really close to each other or the error bars are overlapping, 
there's not going to be a significant difference. <coughs> but, um, and this is where you have to do a very small amount of mental math. <laughs> If arrival is lagging behind, if the shift in arrival, sorry, is lagging behind the shift in green up, what is going to be the sign of this <coughs> simple uh, calculation? So for a given species, bird arrival minus spring green up, when the values are negative. If arrival is not keeping up with spring green up, so let me pick one where there's a clear difference. And I know I'm not a asking you to give me the a calculation, just whether it's going to be a positive number or a negative number. So like for this species, you've got a slightly negative number, and then you subtract this green, whatever that green estimate. Are you going to end up with a positive? Positive, positive yeah. So that's just a long way of saying, Positive, an increase in positive asynchrony is reflective of this, um, sorry, this effect that we might be concerned about, birds not keeping up. And um, as with a lot of studies, we've got the little asterisks where that was statistically significant. Um, so there were some species that, whose arrival times, even if they shifted, so these are arriving earlier, but they didn't shift as much as the shift in spring green up. Um, although the dominant pattern is not to have a significant effect. So you could, you know, are you more concerned about the seven species that did not <laughs> keep up, or are you satisfied, or maybe that's not the word, um, are you glad that it's not worse? Um, it kind of depends on how you're thinking about it. Um, so the majority are, in fact, tracking. If there is a shift in spring green up, they're tracking it, or at least our data are uncertain enough that it doesn't show that they're not tracking it. Um, but seven species did not um, keep up. Um, these were most, mostly eastern forest breeders, so rose-breasted grosbeak, indigo bunning, scarlet tanager, um, some of the species that, that were not. And, and it was, again, if you remember from the change in spring green up map, this is where the eastern North America was where you tended to have more consistent earlier springs. Um, and so these are some of the species that seem to not be keeping up with that. Um, just as kind of an aside, I'm not puffing myself up, but um, the paper was picked up, so Audubon did a thing on it, Washington Post. And then I'm not sure whether this should be a badge of honor, but Breitbart called this climate alarmist. <laughs> um, which is, of course, we weren't saying it was re uh, wreaking worldwide havoc on migratory songbirds, but that's what they do. They distort, um, in some cases, quite badly. But there, there is actually a really important question. It's kind of the so what question. So maybe they're not, I'll just back up to here briefly. Um, and again, this is days per year. So the small, you know, don't be, don't think, oh, well, if it's only one day, what, what's the big deal? That's per year. So over a decade, you know, a, a difference in one day that it's lagging behind would be 10 days over the whole decade. Um, but again, is that a problem? That's a, another question that's really important um, and harder to answer, but that's why I'm excited about the next uh, step in this research, which is to start to look for when there is this increased asynchrony, um, when it appears that certain species and we will kind of hone in on what, in what part of the range does, do they appear to be lagging up behind earlier springs the most. Is there a signal of a decrease in reproduction? Um, and so we'll be using data from um, breeding bird survey routes, um, as, as well as even better in terms of looking for a signal in reproduction, um, maps banding stations, so this is um, mapping, av monitoring avian production and survival. I'm, I know someone's done map stations. 
Productivity and Sorrento, thank you. <laughs> um, so these are places where people are syst systematically um, getting data and we're working with um, uh, Rodney Siegel to get more data for specific species to ask, again, where they're lagging behind. Is there a signal in terms of potentially reduced reproduction? Um, and then if so, one last term, <laughs> I think. Um, if so, then it could indicate what's called a phenological mismatch. And the way that most people are using this is as opposed to asynchrony, which is just a shift in the timing, but you're not really sure if it has an effect or not, or, or not um, phenological mismatch is where there is a shift and there appears to be some kind of negative consequence. Um, so I haven't even talked about the role of uh, butterflies and other lepidopterans as pollinators, but that's a really big issue in terms of changes in phenology too. If the timing of plant flowering and butterfly or moth emergence is not matched up, if there's a mismatch, then plants might not be getting pollinated the way that they uh, need to. So that's another kind of effect of phenological changes that people are paying attention to. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about this next step of research, but any questions on any of this? Yeah, go ahead. Right, so um, if there is, I'm going to read into your question a little bit, but is it, you know, are you looking at things by habitat types or are you considering whether there's a land use change effect? So certainly, I mean, there's, there's been plenty of studies using either BBS, Breeding Bird Survey, or MAPS data on is land use change in the area around that, is, is that potentially a driver of changes in populations or in reproduction? Um, and so that is something we definitely need to account for. We're not, um, I think we will calculate kind of some sort of signal of land use change and include that as one of the independent variables when we're thinking about changes in reproduction from those data. Um, yeah, because, and actually it's, it's really exciting because I have uh, a fair amount of background in land use change analyses, um, and typically people have, e researchers have either focused on effects of land use change, which is plenty complicated on, a, on its own, or effects of climate change, which is also plenty complicated on its own. Um, but I think one of the leading edges is looking for examples where we can kind of do an integrated analysis. And, pe and people are starting to do that. It's just not as common because it is really messy. Yeah. So the eastern forest birds that you talked about that were exceptional, are there differences in migration distances? Mm. Yeah, and there has been, um, so essentially one way of, of kind of using this result, okay, so we have, um, you know, 18 odd species that didn't show an effect and seven that did. Is there some characteristic, you know, essentially looking at species traits that might ex explain why some are seeming to lag? And not from our analysis, but from other people have, that have done this kind of work, it does seem that longer distance migrants, so species that have longer to go from their average wintering ground location to their average breeding ground locations are more subject to that kind of effect. Um, and it kind of makes sense. The ones, and it, it could be, I mean, it, there's just so much that we don't know about migration in terms of, you know, do this, the, the birds that are in a certain part of the wintering range, do they all go to the same part of the breeding range, and there's some evidence of that kind of connected um, migration. Do birds in one part of the ridge, uh, breeding range, um, and this is kind of to your question, is there kind of a cascade of the ones further south start, and then they're all kind of moving through? So um, there's a lot to do with that in terms of do some of those traits explain some of these effects that we see? Yeah. In a lot of cases, yes. So that's another 
kind of corollary, what does earlier spring arrival actually mean? Um, are, because you could imagine, you know, so if we have the signal of, well, they're arriving earlier, but they don't actually start breeding any earlier or later, um, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. It depends on the food resource, I would say, but um, there's, there's definitely details. The, <sighs> I can't remember the specific species, but it does seem like in general where people have tried to do this, um, once they're there and it, um, there's also this complexity of, you know, males might be arriving first and they're kind of establishing territories, but it's really when the females arrive that's the most important thing because they're not going to pair up and, and start breeding until the females get there. Um, but it does seem like, in general, earlier arrival correlates with earlier uh, egg laying and therefore hatching. But there's definitely more to, to, to try to understand how tight that link is. Um, and I, I'll, I just have a few more slides and then we can ask more questions. So, um, in part because uh, we wanted to continue this work, but also to um, see if we could add the, the insects <laughs> um, in, in terms of actually getting empirical evidence. Um, a, a group of people uh, uh, wrote a NSF proposal that was funded where we're thinking about um, how these local phenological shifts, so is green up happening earlier? Are um, birds arriving earlier? Could potentially result in mismatches with a their, meaning, therefore, a effect on populations. Um, and then at this larger scale, um, migratory birds or species a, as a whole, are they responding to some of the climatic changes? Are there changes in the wintering grounds that, that might um, predict that they're uh, trying to arrive earlier? Um, and then, again, using the, the population and uh, reproduction data, um, are there trends in birds, but also are there trends in the insect populations that we're saying is the important food resource that they might actually be responding to? Um, that's the long title of the actual proposal. I'm not going to read it. Um, but we, we are excited that it includes the three trophic levels, meaning the birds, uh, the insects, and the plants, um, because it's not that common to see that kind of work at this large of a scale. Um, and so we have a lot of sites uh, where um, people are observing um, caterpillars directly as well as um, both current and previous work on butterflies. Again, lots of people like to um, go observe butterflies, so there's lots of regional uh, community science data sets uh, to use with that. Oops. Um, and then um, using eBird along with uh, nest, nest watch data, so where there's a lot of detections um, for the same species, in addition to a lot of nest watch records, we can start to ask that question, is earlier arrival correlate with earlier breeding? Um, and then, like I said, adding um, data from the breeding bird survey and, and map stations. Um, and so we do have a website. We haven't published anything yet, but that's the website if you want to make note of it. And I'm just acknowledging the PIs. Um, Al and Hurlbert, who I said you would hear about. Um, so he actually straddles the bird and lepto lepidopteran worlds. Um, Leslie Reese, who's at Georgetown, who is uh, the uh, butterfly expert. And then Morgan Tingley, who's at UConn, um, who's a bird guy. Um, and so the idea is that uh, in addition to the changes in greenness, changes in caterpillar abundance and or population trends and changes in birds will look for places where there is a signal of, of mismatch or not. Again, there might be lots of species that either are keeping up or even if there's increased asynchrony, there's not mismatch because they're breeding um, just at the same rates as they have previously or maybe breeding is affected, but it seems like 
there's an explanation from land use uh, change, meaning loss of habitat, typically. Um, and then, of course, <laughs> the last question is, well, and so what do you do with this? Um, and this, this is uh, not an easy question because as opposed to something like habitat loss where there's kind of clear conservation recommendations, well, you've got to try to preserve the habitats that the birds are um, using. If there is habitat, but because of climatic change, they're not arriving in time to make use of the resources or the insects are declining. I mean, you may have heard these um, global findings of decreased insect populations. So that might be going independent of climate change. Um, you might have what historically was great habitat, but if the birds arrive and the food's not there or the, or the food has declined, um, we're not gonna be going out and <laughs> hatching enough caterpillars to feed all these birds. Um, what is important, and at least for migratory birds that at least are mobile, I mean, just in the physical ability to move long distances, um, one thing that, you know, both work that I've been involved with and I think is really important in terms of uh, planning for and making, um, thinking about conservation in a new way, um, as opposed to just, well, try to lock up the habitat and then whatever needs that habitat will be fine, is um, this term habitat or landscape connectivity. Um, so just as an example of that, this um, wildlife habitat connectivity working group um, has been working across Washington, including uh, specifically by ecoregion. So with an example from the Columbia Plateau, through lots of different analyses, they have been able to um, kind of point to pri what you might identify as the, m the highest priority areas that can provide linkages um, either in a given ecoregion or, or, or across the state that might provide um, essentially ways that um, uh, animals can move uh, through a, an altered landscape as the climate changes. Uh, again, a little bit different for migratory birds but um, still the, the linkages and, and thinking about connectivity is uh, important, I think. Um, thanks. So I'll take questions, um, maybe about 10 minutes, and then uh, if others, people want to stay and ask me directly, but any, any burning questions that people have? Yeah. So I'm curious in your NSF study, um, you know, you're, you're looking at less stuff doctrines. Mm -hmm. And in the earlier slides, you talked about 25 species of birds, the 40 of birds. To what degree do you know that those birds are dependent on the diets on less doctrines? Um, well, we will include birds that we are reasonably confident are using caterpillars, essentially larvae, um, for feeding their young. Um, so, and it's, it's mo in general, most migratory songbirds do to a certain extent. Um, but if there's, you know, what we don't know as well is if there's certain species of lepidopterans that they kind of specialize on or that maybe just historically were most abundant in the area. And if, if that single species starts to change, will they shift? Um, that's an area we just, we don't have a lot of good data on. Um, but it is kind of a basic assumption. And so if there's species that we think wouldn't be relying on that food source, we would just wouldn't include them. We'd say that it's not an appropriate analysis for them. Yeah. Do birds ovulate on a given cycle or spontaneous? Do birds, oh, ovulate on a, on a given rigid cycle? And does that vary? Um, well, the f so for migratory birds, um, like I said, often the males arrive first and they're establishing territories. Um, and then the females arrive um, and she will go into breeding condition. I don't actually know, I mean, it's under hormonal control, but I don't know what the external driver would be. 
Um, but there is, like, essentially once there's fertilization, there's a, that kind of starts the clock in terms of development of the egg, laying the egg. There's very specific times that most species have for um, incubation of the eggs and then how long fledglings, you know, sometimes it varies a day or two, but it, that fertilization kind of starts the clock. Yeah. Right. So, so the shift in bird arrival time is perhaps mentally the same. It it could be, um, and that's something that we can look at because there's global climate data for the wintering range. But my sense is, you know, people have looked at that, and it hasn't been a big explainer of why they might be arriving earlier. So. I mean, I, I guess in some ways we might, um, I'm sure people in our group have thought of this as look, look at a lag where are they actually responding to the previous year's experience, which is a possibility too. And that's how it goes from Yeah, that's a different, that's one of the turns. That's a different issue, yeah. It, yeah, it gets complex very quickly. And that, I mean, that's one of the reasons I say, you know, we're relying on these community science data sets, but intimate knowledge of a, a, even a single species life history and things like that. How, how many years can you expect an adult to be a breeder? Do they always come back to the same place? Um, I think you know, we obviously, we believe this kind of analysis is valuable, but I, sometimes I worry about losing that intimate knowledge of places and species too. We need both, we need both. Peter. Yeah, I, um, I don't think we're going to try to tackle it, but just as a general response, I mean, one of the, I, I guess the way I typically describe it is if there are um, significant changes in either individual or, you know, populations, significant climatic change in a given area for a given population, um, either they can... Uh, stay in place and potentially adapt. And that can be um, through uh, what's called phenotypic plasticity. So as a population, they have the ability to actually uh, adapt to climatic changes, and that's not part of a genetic change. Um, they could move. So if, if a suitable climate here now is, ex exists somewhere else, then potentially, even if it's not the individual as a whole, that population could move to a new place. Or if there's selection pressure for certain things, like leaving the wintering grounds earlier, and those are the ones that get the territories and that get the food resource, you can see how that quickly becomes a pretty strong selection pressure. And you can have microevolutionary change, meaning not speciation, but within a population, genetic changes that result in uh, evolutionary adaptation to en environmental change. Um, and I, there, there is a lot of exciting work. Um, it's in that field. I'm not, I don't do any genetic work myself, but people have detected, whether it's climatic change or urbanization, people have detected microevolutionary changes over, you know, it takes generations, but it doesn't take a thousand years to, to have genetic changes in a, in a population. Um, the one hesitation I have with that is we don't wanna just say, okay, well, whatever adapts, that's what we're content <laughs> as a society with, with, with you know, uh, coexisting with. We're gonna let the uh, 
um, evolution take its course. But it is, it is something, and in some ways, there's been efforts to identify, are there ways to um, essentially um, take advantage of that natural process in some way? Can you provide kind of flexibility for a species? Um, and that's harder, easier to say than it is to do, but it's something that most uh, forward-thinking conservationists are thinking about, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's another possibility. Um, again, sort of you think of the selection pressure of finding enough food for your babies. Um, and, and some species just, there is kind of a, a I would say, more of an intrinsic, uh, as a species trait, some species seem to be more flexible in the food sources and some seem to be more specialized. So I would say that that's something that would be good to pay attention to. Um, and is it changing? You know, is there evidence that it's changing? It's not something we would be looking at directly, but. Yeah, one more and then I'll break, but I'll, I'll stay and, and take other questions. I don't want f f people to feel like they're stuck here. Go ahead. Right. This all has, you know, bush babies could possibly mean shorter uh, dormancy periods. I mean, all these things could have effects on energy stores and everything. It's just, I mean, if. Yeah, w right. We, you sort of, I mean, so one possibility is if, if that summer is extended, do some, I mean, there's plenty of species, migratory species, that already will lay a second clutch, meaning they'll, they'll fledge young and, or it, if it fails early enough, they'll relay. So if that summer is extended, meaning they're arriving earlier and potentially leaving later, I mean, that, you know, we can look for that signal. We're not planning on it in the study, but that's, you know, my little nod to autumn was <laughs> we shouldn't be ignoring that. So if that summer is extended, are there species that do double clutch that weren't before? I mean, again, that, that's potential if, if that lets them have higher reproductive success, that would be a big advantage, obviously. But, it, could, it could be, but on the other hand, if they have lower energy stores, that may not be possible. Right. It doesn't need to be studied yet. Right. And it is very, um, quote unquote, expensive to uh, produce eggs for the females. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. I will stay if you have any other questions, but I appreciate you spending some of your Friday with me.